In August of 2007, Kent Hovind's Creation Silence Evangelism attempted to use the DMCA to silence their critics. Along with many others, we were targeted by CSE's assault on free speech. Following the widespread outrage at such unethical conduct, we had thought the situation had been resolved. However, in mid-July of 2000, CSE filed additional DMCA claims against our very same videos yet again. This time our account was suspended until CSE again failed to respond to a counter notice. In all honesty, we had largely forgotten about the absurdities claimed by CSE, but it seems that they want our attention once again. We would like to introduce this weekly series. We will be dissecting one absurd hovendism each week until we've covered them all. This is going to take a while. CSE asked for more attention and let it be known that we are giving it to them. Hovendism number one, the definition. Of evolution. Now this word evolved is a very tricky word. It has six different meanings. One, one of a set of prescribed actions, not biology. Two, a process of change in one direction, unfolding. The action or an instance of forming and giving something off, emission. A process of continuous change from lower, simpler, or worse to a higher, more complex, or better state, growth. A process of gradual and relatively peaceful social, political, and economic advance. Something evolved. Also, not biology. The process of working out or developing. Not biology. The historical development of a biological group as a race or species. Phylogeny. A theory that the various types of animals and plants have their origin in other pre-existing types and that the distinguishable differences are due to modification in successive generations. Also, the process described by this theory, hey, that one's a rough, rough, very rough version of biology. Five, the extraction of a mathematical root. Definitely not biology. Six, a process in which the universe is a progression of interrelated phenomena. Not biology. Only one of those six touched lightly on biology. Now, let's see how Mr. Hoven fares. And here's how the kids get confused every time. If you're, go if you're going to get into a discussion on evolution, or especially if you're going to get into a debate on evolution, be sure you define what you're talking about. That's how you win the debate in the first few minutes. Define what you mean. Harkening back to one of our previous videos detailing the nature of common logical fallacies, constructing and attacking your own definition rather than addressing the actual biological theory is simply fallacious nonsense. See, the first part of evolution would have to be cosmic evolution. That would be the Big Bang. Ooh, swing and a miss. The Big Bang Theory, as you very well may guess by the name, is not the theory of evolution. The Big Bang Theory is the foundation of modern cosmology, a field of study within physics. It is not, nor has ever been, a biological theory explaining the biodiversity of life. Did you know there is no evidence for that at all? Really? I think someone needs to visit a library. Much like the theory of evolution, the Big Bang Theory has amassed so much evidence that the question is no longer, is this theory viable, but rather, how many intricate details can be understood with our limited technology? As to that lack of evidence, Mr. Hovind appears to be utterly ignorant of Hubble's Law, i.e. the expansion of the universe, the black body spectrum of cosmic background radiation, which is a prediction of the Big Bang Theory, the ratios of lighter elements, also a prediction of the Big Bang Theory. Time dilation of type 1a supernova. This is a prediction of both the Big Bang Theory and general relativity. An accelerating universe, a prediction of the Big Bang Theory. The homogeneity of the universe, a prediction of the Big Bang Theory. And the isotropy of the universe, a prediction of the Big Bang Theory. All of which support the Big Bang Theory. Secondly, we'd have to have chemical evolution. If the Big Bang Theory is true and it produced hydrogen and helium, how did we get all these different elements? The elements would have to evolve from the hydrogen and helium. Oh, strike two. Whatever chemical evolution is supposed to be, Mr. Hovind is attacking stellar and explosive nucleosynthesis. These are the processes by which a heavier atomic nuclei are formed by stars and supernova. As you have probably already guessed, this is not part of the theory of evolution, but is still cosmological physics. So, looking first at stellar nucleosynthesis, the knowledge of nuclear fusion as the main source of energy for stars dates back to about 1920. By fusing hydrogen and helium, stars form the heavy elements carbon through iron. 
This process continues until the star has exhausted all of its helium and hydrogen. Then comes explosive nucleosynthesis. When a star is consumed, it's helium and hydrogen. It undergoes a core collapse, becoming a supernova. In the process, it expels much of its mass, which is then bombarded by an intense blast of neutrons and neutrinos. Neutron capture then leads to the formation of atomic nuclei heavier than iron. Nobody's ever seen that happen. Really? Nobody? Well, then I suppose that these researchers really don't exist. Thirdly, we'd have to have stellar evolution. The stars would have to form. That's strike three. Stars are not living organisms which pass on hereditary traits to their progeny. Therefore, the theory of evolution can make no comment on the formation of stars. However, once again, cosmological physics can. So, the process in extreme brief. Clouds of light elements, primarily hydrogen and helium, condense into a circumstellar disk and begin to collapse under local gravitational forces. This collapse generates infrared energy, heating the core of the forming object. Continued accumulation of mass and heating ignites deuterium fusion. Continued heating and accumulation of mass then ignites hydrogen fusion in the protostar. Did you know nobody's ever seen a star forming? Is anyone else noticing a theme here? Um... Perhaps these researchers don't exist as well. We see stars blow up once in a while. It's called a nova or a supernova, but that is the opposite of evolution. Why don't we see one forming? It's odd that Mr. Hoven would say such a thing, as he has yet to even touch biology. One professor said, now Hoven, you're so stupid. We figured in the laboratory that if 20 stars explode near each other, it'll produce enough energy to make a brand new star. I said, well, that's brilliant. You have to lose 20 to gain one. Remember, Mr. Hoven's original premise is that there was no evidence for star formation. When presented with evidence, Mr. Hoven quickly moved the goalposts. The collapse of stars in the supernova causes gravitational disturbances, which can cause nearby nebula to rapidly collapse into protostars. This is a shortcut in the spontaneous process. It is not the sole process, as Mr. Hoven implies, with yet another straw man argument. I said, you ought to run for Congress. You could help those guys borrow their way out of debt. This is a Hovind classic. Mr. Hovind excels at combining ad hominem attacks and non sequiturs to distract his audience from the quickly shifting goalposts. <laughs> First place, nobody's ever seen this happen. It's purely theoretical. Okay, they assume it could happen, and it's never been observed. It's just uh, purely uh, imagination if they want to believe in that stuff. It's not science. All we see is the opposite of this, and but stars would have to form. Public libraries generally are free. Utilize them. First noted by the Mayans, and later officially noted in 1610, Orion's Nebula is an amazing sight to behold that renders Mr. Hoven's baseless assertion laughable. Observation from the Hubble telescope have shown over 700 stars in the process of forming within Orion's Nebula alone. Even more dramatic, observations have shown that hydrogen and helium clouds collapse under their own gravity, i.e. spontaneous star formation. As shown by the Hubble data, the formation of solar systems, stars, and planets is a fairly common occurrence in the universe. And there's enough stars out there right now that everybody on Earth can personally own two trillion of them to yourself. Plenty to go around. What is that fishy smell in the air? I think it's a red herring. Fourthly, we would have to have organic evolution. How did life get started from non-living material? Hey, would you look at that. Mr. Hoven at least arrives at the ballpark this time. Abiogenesis is a complementary field in biology. Evolution describes the biological processes, beginning with the population of the last common ancestor. Abiogenesis looks to explain how that first population came to be. In other words, the two fields complement each other. They are not the same. Abiogenesis simply requires the spontaneous formation of simple self-replicating systems. After that, the theory of evolution takes hold. The necessary simple organic compounds have been shown to form spontaneously under many environmental conditions. And the formation of simple self-replicating systems has likewise been shown. There is no evidence that this can happen at all. It really does appear as though Mr. Hovind has a fear of libraries and the vast wealth of knowledge they contain.